God is with us mightily. Uh, this is the 17th day of March, 2019, and uh, it's our morning service at the Will Clayton uh, Church of Christ in Humber, Texas. Have you missed some of your blessings because you forgot to give money to the saints of God? Have you missed some of your blessings? Because you forgot to give money to the saints of God. I hope we understand that's what the collection is for. Uh, we want to encourage you uh, with understanding that from 1 Corinthians 16. It says who the collection is for. Now concerning the collection... For the saints. That's, that's pretty plain. I've given all to the churches of Galatia. Even so do ye. On the first day of the week. Let every one of you lay by him in store. As God had prospered him. That there be no gatherings. When I come. Now, I want to give another scripture. To help you understand. Brethren I hope. That you really understand. That God's not just going to save you. Because you love him. You have to obey. I have to obey. Amen. This has been Satan's biggest victory tool. He has really taken a lot of saints out. Because we believe that we're going to be saved just because we love God. I love him and you know he's going to love me and I'm saved. You know, so I'm saved. You know, it's not about what I do. It's about what He do. Well, now you lie. It is about what you do. That's right. See, God has never said that. God has never said it's not about what y'all. It's about what I do. See, that's that's why I'm gonna read this verse because you are the number one component, second only to God in your salvation. You're number one, not the Bible teacher. You. Because you have the authority to go and find out if the teacher is wrong. You're the number one link to salvation. And that's why you and I oftentimes die lost as members in the church. Because we feel like God's just going to make it happen. He's going to make it happen. And it's not happening like that. Or else there'd be nobody in there. You have great, listen, you have some great people. That are in the Old Testament. Both dispensations. They really loved God. Desperately. And at some point. They were bamboozled by the devil. Not without knowledge. Paul said he knew what he was doing. It's just ignorance. His ignorance is he didn't believe. See make sure we understand that. His ignorance is he didn't believe. See the scriptures talk about. To him that know to do good and do it or not. To him it is a sin. But. Your belief makes you ignorant. When you hear the truth, if you say, well, I don't believe that. See, some of us have given pass cards to people. Well, they don't believe perfectly. Yeah, but you have to understand, until they do believe, your prayers are only buying them time. You aren't buying them any mercy at the judgment. Just time. People will, maybe I live you and all you got them is time. We have to obey. And we can obey. And if you're around people that's telling you you can't obey, get away quick because that means they're not obeying. Look at Ephesians 3. You know, this revelation, even the angels don't know about. But Paul says, his is given to him directly from God. But you're going to get it when you and I read. Now, I'm going to tell something to say after that. We continue on with our message as this done. Ephesians 3 1 For this cause I part the prison of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote of four in few words. Whereby, when ye read or you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So that means if I pray, I'm just going to pray for strength to accept what I read. I'm not getting no ass in prayer. No, 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 no. He says, read. 
This isn't legalistic. This is factual. He, and this is his instruction. He, he's dead. He can't change it. He even said if he comes back when he was alive and changes it, don't listen. Let him be a curse in Galatians. So, why are you, ask yourself a question, accepting reasoning and philosophy, but you still can't read what you're saying or what somebody said to you? And you want to get mad at the denomination world. It's the same thing. They're believing what their pastor, their reverend, their doctor, their bishop is telling them. And you just removed the titles from who's talking to you possibly. And I'm not talking to me. I'm talking about whoever you're listening to or whoever I'm listening to. If it's wrong for that person's admiration. You hold it. But when you ask them to read it, they can't. And then they tell you, it's too deep for you. But Paul said, read. Now, it would be deep if it was, you're Latino, and it's written in German. That'd be too deep. Because you can't understand it. Unless you spoke both languages. If you're an English speaker, and it's written in Manchurian Chinese, it's too deep. Because you don't understand it. But if it's the same language, you should be able to understand it. Are they lying to you? Now, when you get to the judgment, God's going to do some type of an explanation before he puts those individuals in hell who did that, who desire to listen to something that you can't read. But see, I'm going to tell you something. It's going to happen to you on the earth before you die because God's going to use the same thing that you do hold fast out of his book because we love to hold fast to the things that are beneficial to us. And they're going to turn on you before you die. So you're going to get a snapshot of how it is to turn against God. Because someone's going to turn against you. You can tell it they're going to. It's God's tool to show, hey, look, look. This was going to happen to judgment. So turn back to me before it's too late. Now, whatever the subject is, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter what, whatever subject you're talking about. This is a deep subject. Even angels don't know. You can read the rest to find out. But Paul says, it was revealed to me. But you can get it by reading. So there is no more private revelations where someone could say this and write. But you have that going on even in the church of Christ. When someone says, God has to reveal it to you. And then you need to just ask them about that. That means when you read it, right brother Amen. or sister? Amen. And they should give an affirmation. Yes. Because they're really telling you. It's whether I tell you it's right or not. If you really want to make some enemies, read your answers. And there'll be a line wrapped around the building. Just read your answer. There'll be a line wrapped around the building. <laughs> Acts 20. Now we understand why we're talking about it at this level. Because you're going to find out you're missing some blessings. You, may, you might find out why some of the things are short in your life is because you haven't been given to the saints of God. And so you're waiting for revelation. Revelation is you read now, so you haven't been given to the saints of God. You haven't been given. Amen, Jesus. Acts 20 and 7. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, read it to the Paul and Mark, continued his speech until midnight. Okay, now watch this mentality. Verse 8, and there were many lights in the upper chamber and where they were gathered together and there sat in the window a certain man named Eutychus or Eutychus however you want to pronounce it, being fulfilled being fallen into a deep sleep. As Paul was long preaching, he sucked deep in his sleep, fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him and embraced him and said, trouble not yourself, his life is in him. When therefore he was come up again, he had broken bread, and eaten, talked a long while. Even to break up, they talked some more. So he departed. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. Means they were a lot comforted. Why is the Bible written like that? Don't know, don't care. So just figure it out. That's what it means. It means not a little. Oh, not a little means a lot. And see, people get caught up on something like this and try to make a platform. It's simple. It don't have to be rewritten in our language. It's simple. Not a little means a lot. Well, oh, that's too simple. Verse 13. And we went before to ship and sail unto Asos there intending to take in Paul for a soul that he had appointed. Binding himself to go afoot. And he went on foot. And when he met with us at Asos, we took him in and came to Mytilene. 
and we sailed thence and came next day over against Chios, and the next day we arrived at Samos and Tarot at Trogillium, uh, and the next day came to Manitus. Now, this is how he got there. Mm -hmm. This guy just raised somebody from the dead. Now, when he talks, people need to listen. Amen. You can raise somebody from the dead if you're speaking according to the truth. People need to listen because he does make mistakes. He does sin. But if he says what's right, you have to listen. Because this guy has power to raise dead people. For Paul determined to sell by Ephesus because he would not spend a time in Asia. For he hasted. If it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem, the day of Pentecost, trying to get back. What purpose? I know there are going to be Jews there, and I want my brethren saved. I want to tell them about the law. Like he went to Mars Hill and another place. Verse 17. And from Melitus he sent to Ephesus, and called the elders of the church. I mean, they were called. So, so if they didn't have elders, you don't think he would have met with them anyway? If I'm not going to see you no more? Yeah, you going to meet with them. But this church... As well, he spent two years with them. He knows they have because he ordained them. He spent two years. I want to make that point. Two years. So why we got churches that's been in service for 40 years? Amen. No elders. I don't know. But I know it's not going to be good at the judgment. Okay, verse 18. And when they will come to him, he said unto them, You know, from the first day I came to Asia, to what manner I have been with you, at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptation, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Point taken. They understand fully the comprehension of giving, which is what he, he's going to eventually tag that. But they also understand all the things he's talked about fully, because he says, you know, I don't hold back anything from you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly. And from house to house. So, you know, I taught you public, at public meetings. And I also had studies in your home. Probably all conversations. Verse 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God. So that's something that has to be taught. Change. And faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So, why is that mentioned differently? God has already told us how to love and serve Him. So when we change and back off from the error, then your faith must shift to Christ. What he said to do. It's, it's, not, it's not difficult. Verse 22. And now behold, I bow in the spirit unto Jerusalem. Go, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Save the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither come out my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel is a message that delivers grace, graciousness, like someone serves you something that we know we're sinners bound for Hades, but it brings the good news we can be rescued. That's what the gospel is supposed to bring. And now behold, I know that you are all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Now he's been told that. That's it. Not that he can't make the trip back. Paul, no, I'm going to die. Well, because he can always make a trip back. <laughs> I mean, it's not like it's at the edge of the world. But he knows I'm going to die. You're never going to see my face again. He says, wherefore I take you to record this day. I'm pure from the blood of all men. Now that's him saying it. That's him saying it. How do we know? Well, the Holy Ghost has let him write it. Paul is showing us you have an ability to be free from men's blood. The people you should have talked to, you didn't. You asked God to forgive you. The people you did talk to, you told them error. You asked God to forgive you. Because you can't do anything about it. Some of them died. That's their choice to have believed that lie you taught. And third, you taught them the truth. Whether they accept it or not. You're, that's the only way you're free from men's blood. That's the only way. You're not going to get free from men's blood by continuing in a lie because you're afraid you told them something wrong. And so I want to continue in that lie. Amen. Because you want to make it right. I'm, that's countless people like that. Amen. They're countless. Because they feel if I just keep on, you know, I, I have to hold on to this because I told people that. But you got to understand that's not how it works. Amen. Paul told people error and killed you for not believing it. Continuing the law. 
What are you going to do with all those people? I ask God to forgive him and teach the truth. That's the only way. So he lets them know that, verse 27, I have not shunned to declare to you the, all the counsel of God. All the counsel. So it says, I held nothing back. It says, I have not shunned to tell you all the counsel. He's clear. Of God. Of God. That's clear. Of God. Now you know there was a group of Jews at the time this is written by Luke. And while it's happening, I mean he's writing, but it's happening. That was a group of Jews that they think they're right. They have the Old Testament to validate. Man, look here. This is uh, Caiaphas. He is of the bloodline. They can point people out. But they feel they're right. They got book, chapter, and verse. This guy just pops up. We raise the dead, yeah, but you know, it could be a magi trick. We don't really know. But he says, I've not shown to declare to you all the counsel of God. So when you read what is taught by him as a Bible fact and not an example of Paul error, what are you gonna do with that? You gotta read it, you gotta accept it. Because he said, When you read, you have my revelation. What was revealed to me by the Holy One, by God's power through Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, you get it by reading. It's so important for you to tell a person. Where's that at in the Bible? Now, they may not remember exactly where. But if what they said is in the Bible, you're still held accountable. Your job is to find out if it's in the Bible. We have access tools, very lovely, in your hand, right in your phone. They're all free. I love that about technology. I'm saying, could you imagine what they could really charge for a Bible app if they really want the most important book? What, a million bucks? Think about it. Bible app. Soul will be saved. We'd all go to hell, those that don't have a million, if you need it. It's free. Free app. But we'll let a person say something that the app doesn't even show, nor in the paperback version. I would say, okay, the reasoning. They'll use one word out of that and then build a lesson around that one word. And we'll go, you know, okay. Sometimes we don't even know it's happening. Because why? Salvation is not the number one priority to the majority of people. The number one priority is love your neighbor. That's their own, their own, the Bible of me. Love your neighbor and do good to them. <coughs> love God. The Bible of me. I've heard that. I've heard that verse so much. The only problem is it's not in the Bible. That's what the problem is. Amen. You know, the Bible does say, "Love God, thy whole heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself." But and it says, "Hang all the law the problems." I don't think they know what hang me. It means that okay, that means I won't covet my neighbor's wife. Yeah, hello. I will not get high. Because I love my neighbor. I'll be showing him how to get on. And I'll be disrespecting my God. See, that's what that means. I won't teach false doctrine about how to worship God because I love my God and I love my neighbor. That's what it means to hang. It means it's so solid I can hang anything on and it'll hold it up. It doesn't mean just I love my neighbor, I love God, I'm in. I'm in it to win it. No, that's not it. See, that's the joke that man has displayed. But you know what's the beauty about God? The sun's going to come up in the morning only because God said it would till he said stop. It has nothing to do with the stratosphere. It has nothing to do with our prayer. Only because he said. And guess what? Everything he said in this book will happen as planned exactly as he said. Be it damnation or salvation. Because he said it. Not because we prayed. Because he said it. And so therefore, let's look at some more. It says, uh, take heed therefore. So you got the whole cost unto yourself. So you take heed. Pay attention. It's very important. And to all the flock. He's telling the elders, watch over the flock. You know, watch yourself too. Because you, he, he wants him, them to be saved. But you have to watch the flock, which is the members. All over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers. What is the purpose? To run the church of God. To rule it like a king. And to handle it like David ruled a king. That's not in there. To feed the church of God. So I'm watching to make sure you're getting fed. Not running it. That's so beautiful. See your supervisor watches to run it. And will run you off if you don't do right. That's what you don't get to do in the church. See that would make you a lord. That's, that's pretty easy. He says, which he had purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter among you, they're not spread fire. If you know what a wolf does, if, if you really have to comprehend it, that's video. It's very horrific. 
They're very vicious. It doesn't matter how little a sheep, the more sucking on it. They love it. Look, that's a little one. Let's eat him first. He's easier. The big one may kick me in the face. And I'm going to eat you. I'll bite you while you're hollering back. I'll bite your legs. Keep biting it. Have half your body eat. You still may be hollering. Little sheep getting ate up. Not sparing. There's no, there's no, oh, they're old. No. Oh, they're young. No. And that's the same way it is in religion. The person ransacks the church. Or they ransack the community. Because there's something they can get out of, whether it's power, whether it's respect and honor, or finances. It doesn't matter. They will not spare. So he said, this was God. But he's talking about the righteous of God who are ex-elders spiritually gone bad. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's saying. So he's saying, you know, you guys need to watch it. Because he says, you'll be the first one to grab. You know who can damage the sheep quicker than anyone on the earth even a wolf the shepherd they know his voice come over and they come in whop I cut him in half I don't have to worry about a thief I get him first because you would be the shepherd and that's why he's called he says you have access they trust you and they know your voice I mean I can tell you a lie I can tell you the truth because that's how we're destroyed. They don't actually hack and chop human beings. It's through the word that they use. So he says, also of your own self shall men arise speaking perverse things. They say, okay, now there's an outsider coming in, a wolf. But there's also inside speaking perverse things. They're perverted, they're twisted. To draw away disciples after them. So now, now that's that person's motive. To draw disciples after them. Now they don't leave, they just stay there and they have disciples coming to them. Therefore watch and remember. So it says watch and remember that by a space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with this. So three total years he was there working and teaching. So at some point within that time he has our Daniels and he's working and talking to them and teaching them total of three full years. So somebody may have wondered where does old Zan and these other guys get the number three? That is, if you're a congregation and in three years you have not ordained all the leaders, including the elders, you're doing something wrong. Doesn't matter what your intention, you're just doing something wrong. Because it's achievable. This isn't a miracle. This is just a God teaching and working. And other guys in reality, he has other churches to care for, and it's done by saying, well, 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 well that, that doesn't mean that you should. Okay, then, why do we baptize the same day then? Mm. Why do they say baptize that day? Why not let's wait till the end? Let's just baptize everybody in January. Get the year off right. <laughs> oh, is your soul is in danger? Well, then your soul is in danger also Amen. behind false doctrine once That's you're right. in. That's right. So if you say we don't need God's government, and Ephesians 4 is clear, you're like paper in the wind without those posts. That, you know what a post does? It catches paper as it wraps around. The wind can blow out there, it just hangs there. That's what it's about. The pillars, they hold it together, and they're strategically placed there by God Amen. to keep the saints from flying out of the kingdom. It's important. And God's going to judge us on that area. So he says here, verse 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God, and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, and to give you inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Two things the word of grace does. It can build us up. So no matter what life you come from, drug addiction, uh, abuse, spouse abuse, doesn't matter what life you come from, evil political gain, it can build you up, and in addition, that causes you to inherit eternal life. With the saints, like Moses, Abraham. Amen. So he says, verse 33, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or prayer. Does that mean he didn't receive? That's not what covet means. Mm -mm. It says I didn't want it. What does it mean? Well, I'm preaching to get money. Mm. Paul says I didn't do that. It doesn't mean, yeah, Paul got plenty of money. He said I robbed both churches just to help the Corinthians. Didn't get none from them initially. So covet means he doesn't have that as his motivation. See, when you go to your job, your motivation is to get paid. Or let's just tell your boss, start Monday. Whenever you go back to work, I'm working for free. Mm. Keep your check. I love you. And I'll be here in the morning. So you see so you you cover this silver and gold. But you know why you have the right to cover this silver and gold? Because you have labored. Amen. And even you to labor in hope. So you should be known, you know. Somebody asked you, what are you here for? 
Well, not, you know, not, we get paid. Oh, no, covetous. No, I'm supposed to, man. I'm supposed to get paid. And I can complain about it, but I don't get paid. Because this is a secular job, you would tell him. Okay, now, let's look at this. And he says, uh, Yeah, you yourself know that these hands have medicine unto my necessities. I said, They're with me. So Paul knew they, they, that's what he means when he told us, no, I work night and day. Preach at a certain point and work. A lot of ministers do that. A lot. It's not a big thing. It's not for you to boast up. It doesn't, it doesn't make him any better than the other apostles. There's 12 others, and they're not doing that. Their workload is that they are working on the gospel only. They say we can't even stop to wait on tables. But Paul has a job and that. It doesn't make him any more holier. It does show one thing that he outdid them all in works. Man to man, he outdid them all in works. Showing that that job should not be stopping you from doing your works as a servant of God. And I'm talking about speaking as an evangelist. Because this is the, the mode he's operating in. Why is that? Because some brothers will think that way. And I mean, no, I got a job. One guy even told a congregation, you pay me more, you see me more. That's a, that's a, that's a truthful statement. Yeah. Brought forth by the house of Chloe. <laughs> I said, oh, you know, he's 100% wrong for saying that. I understand his technical point, but that's not love. Don't take the job if you, if you, if you, if you think it's going to be money, y'all don't take the job. I'm telling you. Don't take the job. Because Satan is allowed to attack you financially. You can take it to the bank. That's why the law said don't muzzle him. Because I'm going to let Satan loose on him. I'm going to let Satan loose on him. To attack him financially. He says that. It's the one position where he says don't. And then he says if an elder does the position of evangelist, okay. He said, hey, don't muzzle him. Because sometimes the takeover says no evangelist. Well, he's going to take it over. Uh, he treat him just like the evangelist. You know? He's doing it for the money. No, he's not. He's going to get attacked. You would say, why? Is the position so holy that it has to be paid? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No. Man, Jesus was ransacked by natural. Who can be a better evangelist than him? The key is, is that you have to understand something, saints. You need to review your mentality if it is that there's a problem with evangelists getting money. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Everybody cannot work a job and preach. And I'm sorry to tell you that. Be it skill level, help, ability to uh, endure the hardships, a list of issues. But we know for a fact everyone isn't able, and sometimes the workload is just too great. That was the some of the involvement with the apostles that the twelve that worked in the Jerusalem uh, in the Jewish region, the kingdom of God. Physically, ex-kingdom, shall we say, but it was still an area where a lot of Jews. It's a combination of things. Paul had the ability to do that. But one thing you have to understand, when he writes 1 Corinthians 9, he says that you're supposed to be able to take care of whoever with him. If it's grandmother, he says a sister. If it's wife, family, whoever traveling with him. Auntie, auntie help raise or she tried. He's Because he says there are going to be people like that. But he says me and my group, we're not saying for us to get the benefit because Paul's group was nothing but male. No, they were not homosexuals. No. And they were none of them married. And the writings about marriage far outnumber anything any other Paul's wrote from Paul who never touched a woman. Mm-hmm. Killing the theory he doesn't have a wife. How can you know about marriage? You don't need a wife to know about marriage. You need this book right here to know about marriage. This is the book that tells you about your marriage and mine and everyone's marriage. It doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist married to a Muslim, if you're a Hindu married to a Christian. It's irrelevant. God created marriage, and this is something that we really have to understand, before sin was ever committed. Marriage is not something made to stop sin. There was no sin in existence. Marriage is made for love. You love someone, that's why you marry. It's nothing to do with, I don't want to stop having sex with one That's not it. Because you're still going to do that if you're a sinner. First Corinthians 7 and 1 through 5 deals with the act of a woman knowing a man is not called fornication if you're married. That doesn't say it prevents it. You won't find the scripture that says you being married prevents you from fornication. It can't stop. You know what's going to stop? Love. If you love one another, you will not do such hideous crimes. That's, past, don't be God. God is going to say, God has protected my spouse from stepping outside. Mm, God has presented your spouse information that will keep them from stepping outside. The prevention is their desire to obey it. 
And if you treat them bad, then they'll show you what they can do. That's how it is. That's the life it is. It's never going to change. never going to change. It's for all nations. So don't look at marriage as some tool to shackle someone to you without you giving them love. It's not happening. Because you know why? Christ doesn't use that tool with his bride, the church. He holds her by his love. He holds her by his love. She holds on to him by love. That's why he says in 1 Corinthians 13, love is greater than faith and hope. How can it be? Because when you have no more faith, no more hope, you always got love. It's the last battlefield. And if you lose that one, it's over. And so therefore he says clearly that he has worked, he has taught, his food has fed himself and others that were with him. Now they didn't just sit down and look at the sky while he worked, but what he said is my hand, we shared funds together as we worked. And he says here that verse uh, number 35, I have showed you all things. How that's so laboring, you ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's what we're talking about. Have you missed all on your blessings? Because you have forgotten to give to the saints of God. Only you can answer that. You, but you might be saying, man, I got a lot. Well, rich people have a lot. But Jesus said, as he watched them giving at the temple, he said, all the rich guys, he knew, he knew who had, had what? He exercised his deity process. They all had a lot. They could have gave you that and more. She gave all that she had, and she's a widow, no man. No man. See, since she gave that away, she has no man going to give her none, but she has faith. Just throw it in a penny, it's a small amount. Not literal pennies, it's a small amount. But she gave more. So the rich people can say, you know, hey man, I got a lot. It's because I'm getting, yeah, but Jesus would say, well, you know, she gave everything. Did you give everything? That's what she said, so you know, 100%. She gave 100%. So that's why when a person says 10%, you could say, well, Jesus, that was 100%. Well, you got to eat. Well, it don't matter. Eat by faith. Then we don't have to eat. You throw, you throw it 100%. See, if you want to get a percentage, that's 100%. Hello. <laughs> Be careful with percentages. 100%. He said more than them. And if you give a tip, you don't have to give 10% of everything you have. You all check your annuities. Every Sunday, you all check your annuities. You going to tie. You have a bottle of polo cologne. It's half. Well, what's half or whatever it costs? $25. I said, half of that. You'd be calculating all week. You're never able to add it all. It'll be Sunday pad. You miss service. You can't tie. Anyone teaching it is an error. Amen. You couldn't tie if you, if you wanted to. They went three times a year. You know, it's easy to calculate three times a year. I know, okay, you know, we're going in March. So I got from now to March to add up 10% of all I got. Not every Sunday. So it, it's, it, he's fixed it where it's, um, you'll never do it. Because if you short him, he says, I, I, I got you. And coming in empty, that's always been a no-no. Because you're telling God, hey, I would have gave you something, but you didn't give me nothing. That's what you're telling him. It's for those who have. No, he said, out of that which you have, not have. Paul never said that no one has. Oh, we're going to read that verse. Oh, he never said that. See, that's adding to the word. Mm-hmm. Out of which you have. We're going to read it. We're going to read it. So he says, verse 36, And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept so and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake. That they should see his face no more. That's what made them the most sad. And they accompanied him into the ship. But you know what's odd about this group? Remember, this is the group he says, even from himself. See, when, when he says, even from himself, he's talking about the group that's there. From yourselves will come people that will steal away sheep. So they're hugging him and kissing him now. Just like Haziel told Elisha, I will not do this. I will not come back and kill the people of Israel. And then by the time he rode that horse or donkey, whatever, by the time he got home, I need to take a thick cloth and wet it down and smother my Lord, which is the king, and I'm taking over. And it, it blew up in his mind. The prophet never told him attack Israel. He said, that's what you're going to do. If he was righteous, he wouldn't have done it. Prophecy doesn't make you do anything. It says what you're going to do. So, so when Jesus said, you'll deny me thrice, Peter. So he made Peter, Peter had no choice. 
because the Lord has spoken and he must do it. That's a lie. Amen. He's just sure I know you're going to do it because I know yeah. the future. Amen. You, you love me now. You're kissing me now. Paul knew, but if you hug me and pat me on the back, when that ship sails away, somebody's going to sin and start stealing sheep later from that very group. Just because people hug and kiss you doesn't mean that they're going to stay that way till the end. Now, I'm not, no one can judge their love at the point he's kissing them, hugging them. But it's going to change. That's the thing you have to understand, everybody here. People change. Is it by some design, God, where they have changed? No. You don't have to change for right or bad. But the key is people do change. But at the judgment, you're commended for good and reprimanded for bad. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I want to show you that the giving, the Lord had a commandment in the Old Testament. And none shall appear before me empty. If you were 12 years old, you have to appear. Your family had better put something in your hand. Because when you came, and see this is the thing brethren teach wrong. They have worship all day. You can't get all the people in that once. Man, people bringing animals. You had a set of priests that were cutting up animals over here. You had a guy getting blood ready to go take in. You had guys bringing in the tithe. You had people going in and worshiping. They want to try to make worship. That was all the worship. Bringing your animal with all the eyes and limbs working. That was your worship. Bringing your tithe accurately counted. And a little bit more to be sure you're on the right side. Was part of your worship. That's all a part of it. Going into the temple to all a part of it. And none is greater than the other because you had some feast that lasted for a week. And all during that time, you wasn't at your job. You were worshiping. They had a worship session. And you had to go. And this is what has to be understood. So, look at 2 Corinthians 8. What does he say about coming empty? Impossible. To do and say it's God. It was us. That said. I'm not giving anything. So he says in verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich yet for your sakes. He became poor though. Through his poverty you became rich. Or, or we might be rich. And here I give my advice. For this is expedient for you. Who have begun before. Not only to do but also to be far a year ago. Now I'll perform the doing of it. That as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. For if there be first a willing mind is accepted according that a man had, and not according that he had not. Out of that which you have. So Paul isn't going, you know, if you have anything. See, that is, see now you'd have to add that. No. See, because God gives us something every day. Listen. If you're retired, and you say, well, I don't make any money. So, you know, you're blessed to retire. I have a dime coming in. But you ate something that week. What did you use for that? How would you eat? Light still on? You got any gas? Maybe you rode a horse. Okay, you rode a horse. Horse still riding, not lame. See, you're blessed. So what you're saying is he didn't bless me. So what did the saints do? The saints sold things to have something just to give to each other and to give to the church offer. Now let's prove that. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. See, so it's impossible for a person to say, well, you, you know, I used to hear this a lot, you know. If I don't listen to that, boy, I, you know, some of it I don't listen to, boy, you get, you get wrangled by some saints, man. You become a member. Y'all really watch you listen to. I used to have saints say, you don't always have money. You can give time. How is time money? I want you to go buy me a chicken from Kroger's a day and just stand there and look at them for a long time. Stand at the thing. Just look at them. Look at them. I spent, I spent three hours looking at you. I should get a free chicken for Ozan. And for my children, too. Time can't buy things. Amen. Money. Money. Amen. And God's not going to let you function without it. He does not. That's why he says it's incorporated into the words. The priests couldn't exist without money because they weren't allowed to do a servile job other than what they did for the law and the priests to do it. Look at Acts chapter 2. Now this is a giving to individuals. So they didn't have, but they sold. Acts chapter 2, if you will. And uh, let us look at verse number uh, 44. All that believe were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men 
as every man hath need. So see, now they're together. This is talking about the saints of God. This isn't talking about his neighbor. Saints of God. If his neighbor came by, I saw you giving that guy some items. You know, man, you know, we had a rough time. Yeah, you would give him something. But this is, if you chose, but this is for the saints. This is what it's talking about. Because they were together. They didn't say all the world. The people who believe, everybody didn't believe. You have a whole nation now that still thinks Judaism is right. And it's in full swing at the time this action is happening. It's in full swing. And so let's look at Acts chapter 4. Now here goes giving to the whole congregation to be given to the leaders to distribute. Acts chapter 4. He says here in verse uh, number, uh, let's look here. Let's get quite straight to the point. 34. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the price of things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. Wow. And this was, was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is in, being interpreted the son of consolation and Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Wow. That's powerful. That's powerful. Why is that done? This is a giving to the church. And it's brought to them. And not to the church. The others are giving to individuals. And so we have to understand is, is that you may have missed out on some of your blessings when they are saying, may we know you have missed out if you have not been giving according to what God says you should. See, it's between you and God. Now watch this. Finally, last verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now this is how we give. We do not tithe. We do not say start with 10. If we pick the number, it would be 100% based on Jesus' example. The lady gave 100%. She gave the most. So you want to give like that? That's the only way. Any other percentage, we can't talk about. It. We can't even tell you to give 100. That's an example. That's so when you start playing with percentages, you get yourself in trouble. Because we don't have that doctrine in the church. 2 Corinthians 9 and 6. But this I say, he which sow sparingly shall reap also sparingly. So if you give a little, what will you reap a little? Benefits. Blessings. It may be your comprehension of the word of God. We don't know. But it's not going to be money. Because he's going to talk about the money part later. And a few more verses. He which sow is bomb, shall reap also bomb. So if you give a lot, there'll be a lot of spiritual blessings. He said in Malachi, the windows of heaven will be open. Amen. Blessings. Spiritual blessings. What comes from the spiritual blessings? He also talks about them getting physical blessings in the Old Testament. But he's going to talk about it here too. Verse 7. Every man according to his purpose in his heart. So let him give not grudge not necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace bound toward you. And you always having all sufficient in all things may abound. To every good work. So there's going to be plenty for you to do other works. You're going to have it. Personal works. Things you want to do. Taking care of your family. As it's written. He had dispersed abroad. So the giver dispersed abroad. Psalms 112 and 9. He had given to the poor. So he gives to the poor people around. That's the giver. This isn't the church. This is the giver to the church. His righteousness remains forever. Now he that ministered seed to the soil. Both minister bread for your food. So the very stuff that you're using. Money to give to the church. You're getting it from God. Because he's giving you that and also food to eat. That's how you pay for your chicken dinner at your house. Because God gave it to you. And multiply your seeds also. That's why we can't tell you how much to give. Because God's going to multiply it. But there's a warning now. If you're stingy, the blessings will be stingy. It's God's blessings to give. It says, and multiply your seed song and increase the fruits of your rice. And God will increase. How do we know? It took the little lad's lunch. That was a lad's lunch. A young man's lunch for him to eat. Took it and fed thousands. Mm -hmm. So I have to understand that. God knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And so if we understand that, let's remember. Sometimes you have to really think about what's going on in your life. Don't look at it physically. Look at it spiritually. And then ask yourself, am I giving? Am I giving right? Am I giving consistently? Do I even come to church? Now that's a message by itself. Mm -hmm. I got to move on. Listen, if you're here, you're not a member of the church. You've got to understand, you must repent. You have to get baptized. Say, so, well, I'm you know, a member of several other organizations, Catholic, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Muslim, Buddhist. But you have to understand, there's a specific in Acts 19, 1 through 5. They think they're saved. They have been baptized in water. And they've been braced in their heart. I am with God. But Paul has this sorrowful task of telling them, do you receive the Holy Ghost when you believe? Their answer is wrong. We have not heard what there be a Holy Ghost like what he's talking about. 
And then it's explained to them. Oh, so what were you baptized? I said, the John's baptism. John's baptism. And they, he says, John's baptism is for change repentance. Saying to the people, to wait on him who's coming, Jesus. Well, that's almost, it almost sounds the same. They've been baptized. Paul's been baptized. He's waiting on Christ. They're waiting on Christ. He believes their sins are ruled. They believe their sins are ruled. They have scripture to show their sins are ruled. Four, one, four and five. Why are they wrong? Because Pentecost has happened as only one baptism, Ephesians 4. <coughs> Paul has a sorrowful task of telling them, you're not safe. You're not saved yet. If they want to be, they will. And this group, this 12 says yes. And he baptizes them. So Jesus said he would die, would be buried, rose again. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And Mark chapter number 16 and verse number 16. He says, he that believes and is. That's the obedience part baptized. Shall be saved. He that believes not, shall be damned. That's his promise and he always keeps it. Be it good or bad. When Peter preached in Acts 2, they asked him specifically, this is God's people. And now they are all at the point of a decision, at the crossroads to be saved. And in Acts chapter 2, they asked in verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? He says, change be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for admission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Not maybe, not might, shall. Not pray about it, shall. He says, for the promises unto you and to your children, all that are fall, even as men of the Lord our God shall come. And men of the words, he testify and encourage them. Save yourself from this unto all, that is, perverted or crooked generation. Then they that glad to receive his word were baptized the same day. Three thousand souls were added unto them and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine in the breaking of bread and in prayers and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The Lord does the adding. In Acts chapter 8 the eunuch he's excited about baptism he sees the water but Philip asks him if you believe with all your heart. So his confession must be I believe Jesus Christ the son of God but he has to be told with all your heart. He stops the chair because the eunuch says, I believe, and he baptized him and rejoices. Now can begin. So, what is the outcome? Paul says the Holy Ghost does all the work. 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized in the one body. What's the body? The church. Colossians 1 and 124. Have all been made to drink into one spirit, but watch this. Who's included? Jew and Gentile, bond and free. If you're in jail, you still got to be saved. Because jail's nothing like hell. Not, matter of fact, you would do well to stay in jail forever on earth compared to being in hell. Amen. Much more different. You pick jail. You pick it. That's how horrific hell is. No one should go there. But unfortunately, many will. Jesus said this action will save you. 1 Peter 3, 21. The like figure went to even baptism. is also now save us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh. Not the water. But the answer of a good conscience to our God. The answer means inquire. I've inquired. I know I'm saved because I've inquired. I've investigated. I've obeyed. And he has received me. By the resurrection of God. That means it has its power. By Jesus' resurrection that God lifted him up from death. Put his spirit back in his flesh and cause him to walk again. Validates clearly. Baptism saves. Or oh, as Jesus didn't rise from the dead, it's a big joke. Where is he at? Verse 22 In heaven, at the right hand of God, angels, authorities, powers, whatever it is that rule, is under him. Only one, not under him, his father. Jesus gives us hope, Revelation 2:10. You need this hope. You won't have it if you're not a Christian. Be thou faithful unto death, he tells us in Revelation 2.10. Why? Because the devil should cast some of us in a prison. Maybe not a physical jail, but an imprisonment. Some torture, some testing. He said, you have tribulation in 10 days, which is a little. It'll be enough to cause you ruin. Satan gets those amounted a lot of times to test you. He said, be faithful unto death. How can you be faithful if you're not a member of the church? You've got to get baptized. If you're here and you're not a member of the church of Christ, you need to get baptized now. Just stay standing and we'll sit down. And we'll get you baptized today. If you leave here and you should die and you have not been baptized, surely we must let you know you will not be rescued. You will never see the righteous again, ever. You'll be tortured. Because God says that's what's deserving after all I've done to rescue you. I gave you my son. You can at least give me obedience. If you believe that, it can happen today. 
Well, yeah, you listen to the message, hit the triangle on the bottom of the screen. It'll show you every number that's affiliated with the brothers that work here. Just start calling and we'll find someone to baptize you. Oh, yes, we will. Not hope, we will. Because we know God is sovereign and he will find it. We will connect. We've done it so much. We can't even hardly remember the count so many. Believe that. You'll never meet them. Probably. You'll probably never see them. You may have even talk to them on the internet. But they exist. If you believe that. And you hear you're a member of the church and you've gotten off track. You stay standing also and ask for prayer. Don't fight the battle alone. Satan's too big. He's too invisible. He's too old. He's too strong. You can't whoop him. Without God, it's impossible. He's taken down every man except Jesus. And you'll be just another number in his book. You can have what you want today. If you come out together, we stand and sing heaven's invitation. The and tenderly Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. See on the portals in waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Maybe see you. Come on. Come on.